brought to you from Melbourne, Australia. This is the Badminton Podcast, a community for badminton players by badminton players, where we talk badminton, celebrate local heroes, interview players from all walks of life, and push you to grow as a player and a person. Introducing your hosts, Jeff and Henry. Hello everyone out there in our badminton community. Whether this is the first time you've listened to an episode or whether you've listened to heaps of episodes, we just want to say welcome and thank you for tuning into another episode of the Badminton Podcast, which is proudly brought to you by Volantware. My name is Jeff and with me is my co-host Henry. We are the co-founders of Volantware, the brand that gives the world the most versatile badminton apparel. Do you hate it when you go onto the court and you're wearing all these brightly colored clothes and they've got heaps of patterns on them and then you actually leave the court and you want to go out with your friends, you want to have a coffee or something to eat and you find that you're wearing all these really bright, loud clothes that don't really fit in anywhere except on the court. That's what we're here for. That's what Volant Wear was created for and it is really about making sure that you can look good and feel good anywhere you go regardless of what clothes you're wearing. So Volant Wear brings us really simple designs, really aesthetic clothing that you can wear on and off the court. Make sure you do check us out at volantwear.com, V-O-L-A-N-T-W-E-A-R.com. There's lots of free resources that can help you with your game as well. So make sure you shop and check it out. You can also follow us on our social media. Our handle is at volantwear, V-O-L-A-N-T-W-E-A-R. We're really excited to be here for another episode of the podcast. We are over 50 episodes now. We've been going for approximately one year and we're really aiming for that 100 episode mark. Henry and I really do enjoy hosting the podcast. We love connecting with the badminton community and giving insights as much as we possibly can and also just hearing a lot of the stories that badminton players have. But before we get started on to this episode here, We just want to say thank you so much to a few people who became Patreons and they helped to support the podcast so that Henry and I can keep bringing you regular and high quality episodes. So we want to shout out to our official Patreons, Lillian Chen and Stuart Brio, and our all access Patreons, Rajiv Rai and Eve Lacroix. That's how he said to pronounce his name. Sorry if I got it wrong, Eve. But thank you so much to all these people for contributing and helping with the podcast. If you would like your own shout out and if you do want to support the podcast, we'll be extremely grateful. It does really help. Just a couple of dollars a month does really help with the costs involved of hosting it. So you can play a part and get a shout out. Just visit patreon.com slash the badminton podcast and we'll have the link in the description as well. So Henry, over to you. Let's introduce our next guest for today and it's going to be a good one. So let's go for it. Thanks, Jeff. So today we have Rachel Honderick. She's 24 years old and was born and raised in Toronto, Canada. Her current world ranking is number 23 in women's doubles and her best women's singles ranking was number 36. Her achievements include being the women's doubles gold medalist and women's singles silver medalist at the Pan Am Games. She's also been the Pan Am champion in all three events, women's singles, women's doubles and mixed doubles. So let's welcome her onto the podcast. Thanks for joining us on our podcast, Rachel. Thanks so much for having me on, guys. So Rachel, let's get started right away. So for the audience who may not have heard of you, can you give us a bit of a background as to how you got involved with the sport? Yeah, for sure. Uh, My parents, when I was younger, introduced me to quite a few different sports. Hockey was the main one, badminton, tennis, basketball. And then um, as I got a bit older, I had narrowed down to hockey and badminton until I was about, I think, 12, 13 years old. And the two sports started conflicting a little bit. And my parents told me, um, you know, you can keep playing both or choose one and try and excel at it. And I made the not so very Canadian choice and chose badminton. Yeah, since then, I guess it's been the natural progression, you know, started off with provincial tournaments and national. And then, yeah, here we are at international tournaments. Mm. And speaking of international tournaments, this podcast, I'm really happy we're getting this done, Rachel, because this was actually meant to be done in January 2020 at the Indonesian Masters. We did plan to sit down and have this podcast, but unfortunately, I had 
food poisoning, <laughs> really bad food poisoning. Yeah, I remember <laughs> that. I remember that. A common occurrence for people in Indonesia, unfortunately. <laughs> So yeah, really cool to have you on. So that's really cool that you decided to choose badminton out of all those other sports. Why? Why did you choose it? Yeah, I think at the time I I remember for hockey, I really enjoyed games, but not practices so much. Where badminton, like I loved it all. At the time, I was lucky enough to be training with older players who were top in Canada. So that kind of inspired me. So yeah, I chose badminton and fortunately have not regretted it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you've definitely come really far with it. So look, when you decided to take it more seriously, from my understanding, you you were playing women's singles and you've made a bit of a transition here. So just a bit of a background, we'll probably dig into it a little bit later, but what were the main events that you were focusing on when you started to get really serious about the sport? Um, yeah, I think in the back of my head, I always wanted to go to the Olympics. And when I started, I played at a private club called the Granite Club. But then when I was 16, I moved up to a club in Markham called Lee's Badminton where Michelle Lee um, was training and still is at actually. And I think that's when the international scene and picture became more of a reality, just looking and talking with her who was competing at that level. So I'd always thought about Olympics, but wasn't sure which year I wanted to go to. So, but I'd say the first big international tournament I really committed to was the 2015 Pan Am Games because that was held in Toronto at our hometown. So I graduated high school in 2014 and then took the following year off of school just to focus on qualifying for the Pan Am Games in Toronto um, for singles. So that was the first year I kind of started to travel internationally. I think I played maybe around 10 to 12 tournaments just to get that full ranking and then competed in the Pan Am Games that summer. Yeah, wow. How important was it for you, Rachel, to have a role model, for example, like Michelle around? Because it sounds like she has had some impact on your career. Oh, it was it was huge. Being in that environment where I'm going from a young kid, um, just at a local club in Toronto saying like, I want to go to the Olympics versus training with someone like we were training together every single day who's in that scene. And it was just so helpful. I think her and the coach there, Jennifer, were great that they always set the standard for us as to be like what you need to do is to be an international player versus just aiming for like national champion. So the bar was set really high. Obviously just the opportunity to be sparring with Michelle was huge. I learned so, so, so much. And it was just cool to be in an environment where it was normal to be playing full-time badminton. Like I remember in my um, final year of high school, you know, everyone's like applying to universities, where are you gonna go? And there was only, I think I was at a class of 140 girls and there was only two of us who didn't go directly into university, which seems so strange in that high school environment. But at least the club I was at, it was kind of normal. Like, so next year, badminton full time. <laughs> so that, yeah, that was, that was huge for me. And just the opportunity to travel with Michelle. I think, like I said, I started playing international tournaments and this was before, I think, you know, her ranking was probably like top 30 around this time. So we were able to overlap in some tournaments. Just getting the opportunity to travel and to terms with her was also huge for me to learn a lot. Yeah. And I think those relationships you build with the people that you travel with, when you're on the road with them for so long and you're helping each other, like coach each other's matches and you're training with each other, eating with each other, sometimes staying in the same hotel room together. I think that's where the bonds really are formed. And I can definitely tell you've already mentioned her name numerous times already in this podcast. And I can definitely see that she's had a really big impact on you. And I guess that's a common theme that we're seeing throughout all of our podcasts is this passing down of expertise, knowledge, wisdom, and guidance to younger players, because that's how generations are built. There's got to be someone leading the way. And it sounds like Michelle's done a really good job for you. Oh yeah. Um, a great job. And like you said, especially in our countries, like our badminton isn't as common. I think these people really stand out and make that huge impact. And like you said, when you're traveling with someone, like you said, we room together, um, eat together, you're able to pick up on so many things, like lessons she would be teaching you that she wouldn't even realize just because it's part of the routine when you're traveling that you just learn and pick up on. So yeah, I definitely owe her a lot to have gotten here. Yeah, it certainly sounds that way, Rachel. And now you were talking about how in Canada, badminton is not as popular of a sport and that you did the non-Canadian thing of picking badminton over hockey. And you said that 
you preferred badminton training over hockey training. What was it about badminton training that you found such much more enjoyable or exciting than hockey? I think I've always, yeah, just like for badminton, the different aspects. So how, I really like how, you know, you can be six foot tall like Sindhu or maybe five foot like Yamaguchi and both can win. It um, just shows like how many different aspects are required to be a good player. So I find with training, they're just endless amount of things to do. So it never, never gets boring. I think I always like that as a kid, just like, yeah, the good variety within, within training. It's definitely a sport for all, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It, when we're talking about, I guess, going back to Canada and what badminton is perceived to be like as a sport there, what's your take on it? What's your experience been? So when you were growing up in high school and talking to your friends about sports that you play, you know, instead, obviously, we know that hockey is such a popular sport there and people will probably speak quite highly of it. You know, what do people think of, of badminton as a sport over in Canada at, at the moment? Yeah, I'd say I think people are not like super educated or know a lot about it. I mean, friends and family member in high school, of course, are so, so supportive. Like anytime going away for a tournament, was it World Juniors or anything? They they were so like excited. Um, I remember it was funny though, like when I go to World Juniors, they'd be like, ooh, like go for world champion. I was like, no, 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 no. Like being a national champion, world champion is very different. (laughs) Whereas like for hockey, maybe if you're the best in Canada, you might be the best in the world as well. I'd say everyone is like respectful of people who are full-time athletes and that, but yeah, they don't have a lot of knowledge of the level that it does get to um, and how big the competition is internationally. And I think just like a, if people ask what you do, I think there's a little bit of hesitation when you say, oh, like I'm a badminton player. It's like, you feel like you need to be like, oh, I'm also a university, you know, just like yeah. it can't be your full-time thing. I get a little bit defensive. Mm-hmm. I think now like people who know me and stuff, they've, fully embrace it and try to follow and support it. But I guess, yeah, if you're talking to the average person and, you know, they see you wearing like a Team Canada shirt and then they're like, oh, were you on the Pan Am team? And you say, yeah, oh, what sport? Badminton? They're like, badminton? Like just not, <laughs> not the same excitement as they probably get if you said hockey or track or something like that. <laughs> Definitely. I guess it's a, a similar story to many of the countries like ours, so Canada, Australia, the US. And speaking of the US, there's also been a common theme in the US where badminton is often perceived as just a sport for girls or for females, especially in the school. And we spoke to some younger players a couple of weeks ago, I think it was now. And they were saying that at the school, the badminton club was only for girls. There was no boys badminton club. Is that a similar thing there as well? Um, actually, no, I haven't noticed that. I would say though, like just in high school, like for school teams, the female badminton team would have like a lot of people who would sign up and try it relative to the boys team. But I haven't, I guess, noticed it outside of school that it's more of a female sport. If anything, we probably get more like, oh, I played that in my backyard before. Yeah. Yeah. More so than the boys versus girls difference. (laughs) The typical kind of response, right? Yeah, exactly. So you started playing a lot more professionally from 2015 onwards. And you, I know that you did actually play some ladies doubles with Michelle as well, but what was your transition to professional badminton like in terms of the events that you were playing? Yeah. So I started off yeah, with singles, like you said, as the focus. And then Michelle and I sometimes would play doubles. Just, I think for me, it was nice to have a second event because sometimes, you know, you're traveling just for one or two, one or two matches. So we would play for fun. And we played some challenges together. We played like Pan Am games together, but it was never like a formal thing. And then I played a little bit doubles with Grace Gao as well, which was a really good experience because she went to the 2012 Olympics in mixed doubles with Toby Ng. And then she retired. And then my second event became mixed doubles with Toby Ng, her, her mixed partner. So we played for a year together. And then I was still kind of ba- uh, always battling that like, I think I always preferred singles and ladies doubles, but at the time, the great opportunity came to play with Toby, so I jumped on that. It was always hard for me to, yeah, kind of balance between the events. I know in Canada, it was common to be playing all three. I remember, I, like, internationally, of course, usually two max, and if it was two, it would be like a doubles and mixed doubles versus singles and singles and doubles. So I always kind of had this balancing act, I think, I was a bit greedy. I just wanted as many matches as possible. I liked playing all three. I remember I played, I think, a U.S. Open and the 
the umpire or the referee said to me, it's really annoying to have to schedule your matches. You're always playing three events. And I was like, <laughs> I know I'm greedy. I just didn't want to make a decision. <laughs> and then I think it was around 2018. So I think two years out from the 2020 Olympics. And I started to feel like, okay, this is probably the Olympics I want to try to qualify for. I was trying to decide like what mattered most to me, um, like qualifying for the Olympics or qualifying for singles. And luckily around two years out, um, Kristen, my current partner, came out of retirement after three years. And we started playing together and had a good start and clicked right away. And at the time, I always knew to qualify for singles would be really challenging with Michelle there. So I always thought, you know, to qualify for singles, I'll have to be top 16 in the world so we can, we can both go. So for me, it was like, yeah, a bit of back and forth. I think it was in 2018. I was like, okay, like playing doubles with Kristen and it's going well. And she was solely focused on the doubles. And I was kind of like, am I copping out by going through doubles? But no, like I do really love playing doubles as well. So I was like, okay, I'll give myself a little bit of time to play both and just see where I can get my singles ranking to. Like see if there's like within a shooting chance. And I think I, yeah, around one and a half, two years out, I got 35, 36, around that area. But I knew that to get to top 16 was another huge, huge, huge leap. So then a couple of months later, I remember I decided, you know what, like there's no shame in changing to doubles. And if I'm going to do doubles, like let's do it right. And like fully, fully focus on it. Because that time when I was doing singles and doubles was just quite challenging. You know, you never feel like you're giving enough to either event. And they're both too tough of events to, you know, only do half of the time. So I think it was, yeah, about a year and a half out from 2020, I, I fully focused it on doubles. Yeah, definitely. And especially the length of matches now where the standard of play is getting higher and higher. It's ladies doubles match can definitely go to that hour and over the hour mark and just having to play that and, and potentially an hour of ladies singles match would really take it out of you. Two matches in a day would be really, really difficult. So it sounds like you made a very wise decision. How did it feel making that decision? Because I guess if you look at it or by the sounds of it, your passion was always in women's singles. What did you do to help yourself overcome that? And when you made the decision, were you disappointed? Yeah, it's a good question. I think, like I said, I kind of had that feeling like, oh, am I like copping out? Like, because my chance might be higher in doubles than singles. Like, you know, what's the shame in just going for singles and not making it? But I was just kind of battling for a bit. Like, I really do prefer singles or just, you know, growing up, it's always like, you know, that you win the singles title, it maybe feels bigger than the doubles one because it is individual or maybe it gets, you know, more of that recognition. But I think what really helped with me is when I started playing doubles and clicked with a partner like Kristen, I realized, you know, I really love it and enjoy it. And I think it, if anything, it suits my personality more. I always had trouble internationally, like you know, being alone on court, like lacking that confidence. So I think the fact that I realized, you know, I really do like love to play doubles. And I think in that way, it suited me more. Versus like, oh, I'm just going to suck this up because maybe my chances are better. <laughs> so I think that also helped me get used to it. And I think I, I did miss the singles training, you know, watching singles, like getting the itch to play. But back in training, um, and I play a little bit in the French league, I still get to play singles there. So I haven't completely dropped it. So yeah. Oh, that, that's really cool. It sounds like you're definitely not just at peace with that decision, but you are very happy with the decision now because... Being a singles player can be quite isolating and I know how that feels. And I'm sure if you speak to a lot of singles players, we've had people on the podcast say potentially singles players could be more introverted because they have to do, they do everything for themselves, especially from a smaller country where you don't have a huge team around you traveling by yourself, organizing training by yourself with other countries, et cetera. It is tricky on that side of things. But Rachel, I want to bring you back to when you said when you started playing with Kristen. And that was the fact that you got along and you, you clicked really well from the very beginning. How do you know that? Like, how do you define yourself clicking really well? Are there certain things that you feel really make a really good doubles partnership? And on the flip side, do you think there are certain things that will break a partnership or make it so that you can't really play together? Yeah, that's good questions. It worked out well because Kristen and I were um, good friends when we were quite younger and juniors. And then she unfortunately had snapped her Achilles, so stepped away from the sport and then came back 
and yeah, luckily for me, came back at a, at a really good time. And I think like on court wise, actually, when we were first playing just uh, national tournaments, that singles base that we both had actually helped our partnership because she has, like I said, she was our top, top singles player before she got injured. So that ability to play that kind of half court singles rally, I think worked really well for us. Just this feeling for players that like we can rally all day. If anything, it felt like we were playing probably two singles the encore together. So, but I'd say it was an encore thing that worked well. And I think it's still something that helps us kind of like a backup plan in every game. Okay, we're just going to have to rally and get everything back. So I think that helps. And then also personality wise, I think we both click well, like get along um, on court. Both are very competitive, but on court would never get angry with each other. It's no one has like a, a big ego. So I think that suits us really well. If anything, we're both kind of a little bit shy and timid. So maybe one of us sometimes needs to step up and be like the more brave one when it comes to situations. But yeah, I think it works well just like personality wise and also style wise. Yeah, the way you describe it, Rachel, is it's almost as if you're both complementing each other's playing style and that when you do anticipate challenges, you can always fall back to the two singles half court play if, if you really needed to. So if you were to say, translate that into some of the, I guess, when you're looking at some of the top women's doubles, men's doubles players and mixed doubles players out there and talk about more general common characteristics that you see in the best doubles combinations and what has worked for you. Is there anything in particular, generally speaking? Yeah, I think it for us, it works well. I think Kristen is more the creative one who will create good opportunities in the rally where I am like to be more of like the workhorse. Like I can just smash all day, run around all day, but she'll like create the opportunities and kind of finish those points. That works well for us. But yeah, I think getting back to like the singles and doubles part, I think for us actually, it helps that we had that singles base and didn't specialize until a lot older. I think now, like you said, with the women's singles matches getting to an hour and a half and being that half court singles, I think it's huge that we've had that plan B and it's, we've probably gone to our plan B more times than not and have to want to win ugly. But I think that confidence of like being able to move around the court and, and last, it uh, goes a long way in women's doubles. Yeah, definitely. And not letting out any secrets, but I had the privilege to coach against you. And that was one of the things that we were not trying to play against you at. So a long, hard <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Half court women singles match. Both of you are very, very strong in that way. Now, I guess building onto Henry's question, when you look at the top women's doubles pairs out there, is there a certain pair that you are looking at to try to model in particular? That's a good question. I don't know if we have uh, one in particular. I think just in general, I think we probably are trying to learn from the Europeans a bit more so in like the tactics part of the game. For us, that is the one part we are missing, like the ability to win those quick points and play smarter. That comes a little bit just with not having like a coach traveling us and like learning those set plays. So I'd say for that, we probably look more at the European teams because I know the Asian just like they can smash more like physical all day, which I think is one part we're not trying to rely too much on right now. It's learning the tactical side. So watching, you know, maybe... Camila and Christina back in the day, or just like the European teams to see the set plays they set up with return of serve, or even the Danes like Mike and Sarah with their amazing run at Indonesia. And then, but they are able to win those points. And you're like, how? So I say for us, we probably try to learn more from the European teams. Yeah, definitely. And when you look at the hardest pairs that you play, do you personally like to play against? the Asian pairs, so that kind of play? Or do you like playing against the Europeans where it's more set plays? I think we prefer and do better playing against the Europeans. Like I mentioned before, I think our plan B works better against those teams as long as we can survive and get out of those set plays. I think once the rally is extended, we feel a bit more confident. Whereas against the Asian pairs, if you're playing Japan, we think we can rally. Well, they, they'll teach you something about rallying. <laughs> Um, and I think we struggle against the Asian pair since I guess when the Europeans play the Asians, they have that set play, maybe quick point advantages where they can get where we don't have that. So we don't really feel like we have anything over those Asian pairs sometimes. 
because I think we're kind of a little bit in between. We're not as physical as the Asians, but obviously not as tactical as the Europeans. So for us, we yeah, feel a bit more confident playing the Europeans. Yeah. Yeah. And it sounds like there's still a bit of development opportunities there for you to catch up to both sides from a European and Asian playing style. And building on from Jeff's question there about the different types of doubles pairs you played before, do you find it harder to play against a right-handed, left-handed combination in comparison to two right-handers? Yeah, I do. No matter how many times you have to remind yourself, okay, like don't hit that corner, that left-right combo, especially as the rallies get extended, you're going to forget it at one point, you know, and regret it. So I definitely do think it's hard to play against and just something else to have to think about. Especially like I find the Europeans know how to use it so well, whether it be like the forehand cross to set up that lefty forehand or whatever it is. I think it definitely bite me a couple of times in a match for sure. (laughs) Yeah. So it's been quite insightful as to what you feel is really important for you and Kristen to develop as a doubles pair. So if we kind of segue now into the Olympics. So the goal was the Tokyo 2020 Olympics, which is now 2021. Have you found that this delay in the Olympics has allowed you to work on certain things? And if so, what are the certain things you've decided that you really do want to spend the time working on during this period? Yeah, it's been unique. Like I think ever since things have been able to open up again, I think around May for us, badminton, it's been like the largest training block I've had since as far as I can remember. So that has been good. A challenge for Kristen and I is actually, I haven't trained with her once since the All England, since we live in different cities. So it's been more like individual progress. So I think for me, it's been good. I can finally get a, spending the time to get a good like strength and conditioning program back up that I can consistently do. Because as you know, like this past year when we were playing around, you know, 20, 25 tournaments and you're at Airbnbs or hotel gyms, like it's hard to maintain that. So that's been good. And just with the extra time in the day, not having to travel and commitments, I can think I can spend the time doing, yeah, more of those fine details that you get in doubles. I think for me, another thing I noticed from the transition from singles to doubles is I got this impression that to be, you know, training hard, you always have to be tired and out of breath. You know, that singles grind. Where sometimes for doubles, like the most productive practices can be just serve and return not so physical. So just with that extra time I have now trying to spend those time working on those things, maybe the first three shots or getting someone just to feed me like specific technical things that I know I've been lacking in my doubles. I think for me specifically, just coming from singles, I never had a very good base in the front court. So just like watching a little bit how people anticipate after they serve, just things like that. But it's been, yeah, a good time to get to play around with those things and a rare, yeah, like I said, rare amount of training block uh, to get, which has been nice. Yeah. That's really funny that you say that because Rachel, as a former singles player and coaching now at the moment, I always used to look at the doubles players and I used to be doing stupid, crazy physical training, right? And then they're just doing either like standing driving or serve and return. And you always think, what they just get to stand there and they have to cover half the court and you're thinking what are they doing i have to train so hard and then now you're on the other side how does it feel to be on the other side it's a bit strange because you probably feel a bit lazy as well at the same time yeah i have to say that was part of the reason also i didn't want to change the doubles because i that was the impression in canada is like you know everyone's a singles player until they get older and lazy they switch doubles (laughs) yeah (laughs) And I I hate that. I never like to be like thought of as lazy. So that's the part like I I didn't like. So I think even for doubles, I'd always want to be doing like smash drive or the harder stuff. And then Kristen is always like, you need to work on that stuff. Like your serve or turn, like this, the easy stuff. (laughs) But yeah, I'm like, I'm just standing here, even though that kind of practice is probably the most important. So that has been an adjustment. (laughs) Yeah. And so hopefully by the time you and Kristen meet up, you're both, you know, much better doubles players when you connect again. In terms of, I know that because you're both separated right now and that you're focusing individually on the more technical details side of the doubles game, what happens with your strategic and tactical development? Because when we're talking about how you want to develop that more tactical side like the Europeans, in terms of your engagement with Kristen at the moment and your plans on 
how you're going to play tactically going forward. Are you doing much with the two of you? Uh, I think we're good when we were in that, yeah, like that busy time this last year of playing like lots of tournaments so we could watch our matches together and directly after think of those specific tactic things to work on. I think it's been hard in this, I guess, off period, not playing matches and getting exposure to those top matches to like think of those things that we need to work on. So I think it's been quite individual in this time. I think it's a bit hard for us because I guess we don't have like a framework of improve this part. We want to move to this. It kind of would come up as we got to play those top matches. So I think, yeah, that's probably been one of the challenges, not getting matches together during that time is these scenarios coming up in a match where we realize, oh, we need to address this kind of thing. Sounds like potentially a, a bit of Zoom and sharing a screen and watching some matches together potentially um, during this period. Yeah, exactly. So with the challenges that you do face being in Canada and because as I understand, there's no centralized national team and because of that, it is difficult to play and train with Tristan. So if we kind of look into life as a Canadian badminton player, we've been able to talk to several Canadians on the podcast but I'd love to hear as to what you feel are the main advantages and disadvantages of being a badminton player in Canada in comparison to potentially a different country or a different sport. Because I guess there's a lot of people who say, okay, it's really hard because X, Y, Z, the country is really big. It's not centralized. There's not enough funding, et cetera. But there are some upsides to it as well, isn't there? Yeah, there are. I'd say the one advantage Chris and I have, have found is like, in the past year, we have gone to train in Indonesia, Taiwan, and then the European, we tried Denmark, France, and Netherlands. So we get the chance to see both sides, you know, the Europe versus the Asia training styles, or even French versus Danish, because we're not like held down by a national center. And I think being Canadian, maybe like not so threatening, people are quite friendly and open to us coming, which has been nice. So I think that's actually one advantage we have seen because we talk to let's say these Europeans who are in their countries and they haven't really trained anywhere else other than their home country because I mean I guess they don't need to they get everything they need at home but I think Mm. there is the advantage for us meeting people from both sides and you know getting to spar with both styles and seeing both styles and kind of taking pieces from both so I think that independence can be an advantage and disadvantage because I guess the other side of that is we don't really have a coach who's overseeing all of that and we are going to these countries and they are like being super helpful and inclusive and letting us train with them. But I guess, again, like we don't have a coach like overseeing it and, you know, focusing on every detail like we see they get in their countries. Yeah. And when you look at those different experiences that you've had with the different coaches from different parts of the world, have you found a kind of like a combination of those things that really works for you? Is there an element of the Asian style coaching that really works and then complemented with a certain part of say the European or the French or the Danish? Yeah, the training styles, we like there's bits and pieces that we like from both, like for certain tactical part, I think the European training is great, maybe more specific, like you're doing a drill and the first five shots can't be a lift or more specific like that. And where the Asians is just great for the sparring, not as much like maybe specific feedback from the coaches. But yeah, I think training wise, both equally beneficial just in their different ways. Yeah, definitely. And I guess it's a common thing that's talked about as to which style is the best. And from my understanding of it, when the Asian style is implemented, it is just about that repetitiveness, isn't it? It's just building that muscle memory, doing it over and over and over. So it just becomes a natural part of your swing, of your footwork, of your play. And I guess if you look at the technical skills of the Asian players versus the Europeans, I think that's where it really comes in because it's just amount of time on court, the number of shuttles that they hit. And then from the European side, it's really about the thought behind the process. Not saying that the the Asian style doesn't teach thought, but it is a lot more rigid. Like you said, doing exercises where you can't lift in the first five shots or you can only lift once in the rally, for example, rather than just playing. When you're looking at your current development, do you feel like you need to 
do both still or are you kind of happy with kind of the repetitiveness of it and you're pretty happy with the way that you're reacting and your technique is and your stroke and the quality of your shot where you can focus more on the tactics now? Uh, yeah, me and Kristen, we, this is the one part we disagree on, I think. <laughs> it's always a joke between us that I think I just love to play as many hours a day as possible. So like that part of the Asian side, I prefer like six hours of training, sign me up. I really enjoy it. We're hurt. <laughs> we always joke. She doesn't love badminton as much. And just unfortunately with her history of injury too, I think the European like really high quality suits her a bit more. And this is maybe the shorter sessions as well. So we always joke, okay, I'll go to Japan and you'll go to France or wherever it is. But um, <laughs> I think at the beginning of our partnership, like you said, just the age style actually worked better. Like I just need to put in my time of like, doing drives, doing front court, doing smash drive, because I missed that doubles foundation. So I think it worked well, actually, when I first made the transition, we went to Indonesia for six weeks or something like that. And I just needed that, like, just time, like hitting against the wall, just doing those basic double skills. Whereas I think now, like I was saying, with our weaknesses being more tactics, that now probably the European side would be a bit more beneficial for us in what we need just a bit more thought into what we're doing and why. So I'd say, yeah, that has kind of changed a little bit in this past year. Yeah. I guess it's like one of those things that once you've developed or feel like you've developed your European side well enough, you might go back and say, okay, now we need to start developing the Asian side again. Exactly. Exactly. So Rachel, if we kind of look at badminton in Canada at the moment, and of course, there's been some really top players. We had Andrew De Becker on and he got to a really high level. There's definitely been a lot of high level badminton players. And then Michelle has definitely taken it up a notch and really helped to pay the belief. Yeah, the belief systems of Canadian badminton players, because all of a sudden it's possible now. So what do you see is the future of badminton in Canada? Do you look at it as something that's really growing? It's really positive or... Is there something that needs to thoroughly change for us to get better results? I think it's fascinating that the setup we have now, I think so you guys have heard, we are very warehouse club based. So in near just north of Toronto in the city called Markham, we probably have like 15 to 20 warehouse clubs, maybe five to six that have competitive players that. So the amount of people, and I'd say the level is increasing, which I think is extremely positive but i think a a difficulty we have as i said we have these different warehouse clubs and for example now in ontario jason and i i'm just thinking of the national team um, for now jason hoshu and i are at one of the clubs michelle lee is at another neil yakur and Brittany tamra at another and then ryan yang and josh herbert you are at a different one and these clubs are all within a 10 minute drive of each other but we all train separately So I think the struggle we face, even with the amount of people and the level increasing is it's tough because for our coaches, it has to be like business is first, Uh which I, which I can't blame anyone for. I mean, it's just the reality, like for their business to survive, the warehouse clubs are competing against each other is a little bit kind of like, if you go to one, you play at one because there is a bit of competitiveness. And I think in a good way, the amount of clubs is really raising the standard because it's very competitive between all the clubs. But it's become difficult that for now, like juniors coming up, if they aren't doing well or, you know, lost in the tournament, then their parents change clubs. Oh, okay. And okay. there is this just like a lot of club hopping, which makes it really difficult for coaches. You know, you invest a lot into a player and then they switch. So in some way, I think it's like the standard is definitely getting higher and higher. But then for us to like, break that surface. I'm not sure what it is we're missing, but I think it will still be a little bit difficult just given the setup it is now. Because it is a bit crazy that we can be 10 minutes away from each other, but not training together when there already is so few of us at this high level. And then from the other side as well, it's just since our coaches have to be focused on the business and managing the club, that's also why they understandably aren't able to travel with us internationally and you know, really watch us play and spend the time to really like develop us. Like when I go to these national centers, the coach's job is create Olympians, create medalists, like make these two or three pairs as good as possible. Whereas for our coaches, like 
they for hundred percent they do care and like do invest time with us. But I think the business comes first, which yeah, again, like I can't blame them for just the way it is, but I think that is a part that will always like hold us back. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess if in their minds, you know, the business comes first and not the players and the development of the players, it's sort of an uphill battle. And the way you started talking about the warehouse system, it almost seems like it's prohibitive for the professional players or the higher level players to play at the other warehouses or clubs so that there is no sort of interpersonal intermingling, I guess, of the high level players. Whereas at the junior level or the younger level, they're just sort of hopping around and there's just no it seems like there's no commitment from both ends to, you know, the coach developing the players and thinking about the players and what's in their best interests as far as development is concerned. And then you've got these juniors uh, who aren't committing to the coaches in one aspect as well. So that does sound like a bit of um, organized chaos there, Rachel. And (laughs) I think, yeah, there certainly sounds like there's a lot of improvement there. I guess if you were to look at Canada, badminton Canada, over the next five to 10 years? Or what do you think, if you had to prioritize what needs to happen next, what would that be? Uh, yeah, I would say that like a centralized training area would be huge. And not, not even doesn't have to be like permanent or just like us coming together more often, you know, whether it be like in a month at a time or whatever it is, a few weeks at a time. Because yeah, we're all going away to get sparring internationally where, you know, we do have decent players like 10 minutes away from each other. I mean, just finding ways for these club owners to like, look at the big picture here. If everyone's improving, everyone wins. Being able to put that business aside, at least, especially when it comes to like the top, top, top players. Yeah, look, I guess it is really just about that bigger picture, isn't it? And it does kind of remind me of what my former coach, so he's from China, He was a Chinese men's doubles player in the national team. And what he said to me once, it it really brings back some memories and it's really appropriate for this situation, I think. He said, Jeff, it's not the name on the back of your shirt that matters. It's the country on the front of your shirt because there's the flag on the front of your shirt, right? I think that really rings true here because it is about the individual player and you have to be the best that you can possibly be, but at what cost? And who are you competing against? You're competing against the other players in your country. Yes, you want to be the best in the country, but it's a big, bad, wide world out there. And you're really not going to get anywhere without having the people around you to help each other get to that position. And I think you can just really see it, especially in Europe. Yes, I do feel it is a little more individualized in terms of European players, but you can see it in the Asian countries, right? You can see it so much where they want to be good themselves, but it is really about the country, the flag on the front of their shirt that really matters compared to the name on the back of the shirt. Yeah, I'd say this can only really benefit everybody. But yeah, I think it just needs someone or Batman can like to step up and like create that. But again, I guess it is these individual like coaches' businesses and it is such a competitive market. Like I also understand how it is tough for these coaches because they have lost players to these different clubs. So it has created that like, maybe not the best environment between clubs. So yeah, it's just hard to see unless there's like a centralized center built or made like where we all could go. Yeah. I don't want to dwell on this for too long because I don't want to be the one that keeps building on the, I guess a bit of negativity around this, but just hearing this, I've heard this from Michelle before as well. And it does really seem like the bottleneck or the ceiling that's really holding the top players back. And like you said, many times, completely understand they need to take care of business. They've got jobs, they've got families, they've got to support that. But I don't know, I was just thinking about it before. Could there be a system where there's commitment from all the club owners? That would mean that they'd have to agree though on on something together where say all the top players can train together and you rotate. So if it's only 10 minutes away, then Monday it's here, Tuesday it's here, Wednesday it's here. And then that kind of keeps that, you can actually play with the different players. And yes, you keep your own club membership with the club that you belong to, but then you can actually train together. Because I guess if you look at it from, I always use Indonesia as a good example in that they have a really good club system where it's a club level where you're competitive, but there's definitely no segregation where if someone traveled to a different club, they're more than welcome to train 
And then, of course, there's that step from the club level to national level. And it does sound like that is missing a little bit because, like you said, there's only so many top-level players and you need to be together. And, Rachel, I guess the question for you is that I know I've seen you get along with all the Canadian, like all the Canadians get along really, really well. Is it kind of a relief and really nice when you actually can go overseas and you don't have to worry about this? You can all train together. Yeah, it is. And I think it's been unique in this cycle that we've had so many, I guess for us, like a doubles team in each event going for it. So I think that's why the funny thing is a lot of us feel like our best training actually happens overseas at tournaments. For one, because we can train together, and two, we can also ask other countries to play. I think that's why Kristen and I haven't minded so much the long tournament stretches, because one, for us, it means like we're not in different cities, so it's good for us. And then yet, like you said, we're getting to play with these Canadian teams, and you number two, get to spar with the different countries. And I think for me, that's been huge, just because I think another difficulty in Canada is just, or what I appreciate so much when I get to go to these national centers internationally is, training with people on the same page, with the same mindset and same goals. I think I struggle on balancing that a lot in Canada, training in the clubs. I can be training with someone whose goal is provincial champion, national champion. And so it can get a bit frustrating sometimes because I, you know, want them to want to train more, just be more motivated, but I can't blame them because it suits what their goal is, which is completely like up to them and that's fine. But it's really refreshing to be surrounded by people who share the same goals. So they you know, understand, oh, this happens internationally, or you need to put in this amount of time, or you need to be this focused, that kind of thing. So I think that's always like super refreshing at tournaments and something I kind of battle every day back home. Yeah. It's just fun, isn't it? Like, because you can just spend so much time with the whole team and yeah. Yeah. So fun. And yeah, like you said, just for both for the on court and the off court part, because yeah, I know four years ago, or just talking to Michelle at hasn't always been like this, that we have a group of, you know, six or seven traveling. So that's been great for us to have each other socially as well too. Yeah. This is going a little bit off topic and it comes to Jason Hoshwe or Hoshu. And I've seen several Instagram stories about uh, like on the track. So you're running with him, but every time it seems like you're beating him, do you you always (laughs) beat him at running? (laughs) (laughs) I hope Jason listens to this. Um, (laughs) We joke about it. So if it's, if it's more than one, like my, my strength is long distance and his is sprinting. So Mm -hmm. if it's anything longer than two laps, then I got it. And if it's anything less, Jason's got it. So we, if we do a program, let's say like gradually goes from long distance to short distance, I'll win at the beginning and then he'll take over when it comes to the sprinting part. So yeah, I always make sure you know the camera's on for the long distance. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> they're, they're the ones I see then, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Actually, or the joke is Jason will try hardest when the camera's on. So. <laughs> <laughs> and you're able to train with everyone on the track or is that kind of just? Uh, we could, but for now this summer, it's been um, just Jason and I and this one Indonesian coach we have from our club. So he's been nice enough to take us out uh, in the mornings, but yeah, it's just Jason and I. Okay. Awesome. So look, Rachel, we've been talking for a little while now and we've put you under the pump. We've asked quite a few questions of you, but is there anything that we haven't asked that you feel that we should have? Um, good question. I'd say just that maybe just a bit more about like the, as a Canadian, just like in this COVID situation, it's been extremely, I guess, unique. A lot of people since badminton is not like the only thing or can't be, whether because of work or been in school. I think it's been really difficult for people or just a challenge, you know, the balancing act of one more year of like Olympic qualification or not, or what the commitment is going to be. And like we were talking about earlier, just the announcement of these new bubble of tournaments. You know, some people had registered for school thinking that, you know, we won't be traveling for this year or, you know, how to find out if they can defer school for a year. But yeah, just the unique, challenges, I guess, of one more year, like as Canadians or people who like, we have a lot of us other stuff like that we were planning on doing maybe beyond the 2020 Olympics that I guess it's been a unique time for sure. Definitely. Okay. And on that note, your journey to the Olympics is definitely a very interesting one. So if there was someone out there listening who either wants to get in contact with you or just follow to see how you're doing, how could they do so? Yeah, I'd say either Instagram or Facebook. My Instagram 
handle, just my name all in lower caps and same with my Facebook, just my name. So um, yeah, if anyone wants to reach out, I'm always happy to chat about badminton or anything like that. Awesome. We'll leave your Instagram handle in the description below for any listeners as well. So Rachel, thank you once again for being on our podcast. No problem. I really enjoyed it, guys. Thank you. So from Jeff and I at Volant Wear and the Badminton Podcast, thank you so, so much for tuning in and having a listen to this episode with Rachel where we got to learn a lot about her journey, her transition from women's singles to women's doubles and just her general take on what badminton is like in Canada and what she needs to do to improve and develop on her way towards the Tokyo Olympics. So if you've enjoyed this episode or any of our other episodes, then just send it to everyone you know, whether they love badminton or not. Badminton is a sport for all and everything we talk about can benefit you in both the sport and in life, hopefully. So make sure you get out there, train hard, play hard and have fun and share your love of badminton so that we can show the world how incredible our sport is. And if you want to connect with Jeff or myself, then you can connect with us via our Instagram channel, Facebook channel, YouTube, and on our website via www.volantwear.com. Our handle is at volantwear, V-O-L-A-N-T-W-E-A-R. So feel free to reach out to us, ask any questions you have, request any topics. We'd love to hear from you regardless of whether you think the question is too easy, too hard, or is plain silly, we won't think that. We will answer it for you, just like we have on other episodes as well. So also give us any feedback if you have any, and we will see you on the next episode. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks for being on the this podcast. This podcast and was brought to you by Volantware. Thank you, guys. The most Thanks. versatile badminton apparel you'll ever own.